Washington calling counter spy. Washington calling counter spy. Washington calling counter spy. Presents Phillips H. Lord's Counter Spy. Backing our great army and navy at the front is our invisible army of United States counter spies who work quietly, effectively, and swiftly against the enemies in our midst. They are the dread of the German Gestapo, the Italian Obra and the Japanese Black Dragons. Imagine the ace counter-spy of them all as David Harding, specially appointed with authority to work however or wherever he will. Three weeks ago, in Washington, a very prominent bachelor by the name of William R. Terrace stood in the center of his expensive apartment. The time? 11.25 at night. A dim light burned on a little ebony side table. Mr. Terrace stood there his face was ashen white. Great beads of perspiration stood out on his forehead. Go on. You betrayed your country. Go on. Go on. Pull the trigger, you coward. Go on. <laughs> William R. Terrace has just committed suicide in his living room. He left a note saying it was because of ill health. It's a clear-cut case of suicide, Mr. Harding. You're the chief, and what you say goes, but it's just the case of a wealthy bachelor in poor health. Well, I admit, Mark... William Terrace probably did commit suicide. But remember this. We're at war. The Gestapo are experts at making a murder appear to be a suicide. Then you're really going to investigate it? Well, I think I'll at least ask a few questions. Yes, sir. Now, the note Terrace left, Mark, said he was committing suicide because of ill health. Well, I think I'll drop in on his doctor and see how bad his health really was. <laughs> You would know, Doctor, if Mr. Terrace was in poor health. I was shocked at his suicide, Mr. Harding. From everything I know, Mr. Terrace was in perfect health. Mm. That's quite interesting. I think I'll go over to Mr. Terrace's bank and see if finances were worrying him. No, Mr. Harding. Mr. Terrace's finances were in perfect condition. He was worth nearly three quarters of a million he had many government bonds and securities. Thank you. Mark, when a man commits suicide, and it isn't his health and it isn't finances, look for the woman. Exactly. And that's what I want you to do, Mark. Yes, sir. Now pick six men, cover Washington from head to foot, and find out what woman William Terrace paid special attention to. Yes? Mr. Harding, I've just completed that investigation. Man in question was spotless. Described as congenial, social, friendly, but never escorted any particular woman. Was known to be very proper and old-fashioned in ideals. All right, Mark, that ends that lead. Meet me later. I'm going to take a long chance and visit the accounting firm which checked Terrace's books. <laughs> Why, yes, Mr. Harding. We've been the accountants for Mr. Terrace's firm for nine years. I want you to go to Mr. Terrace's office and get his office pad of appointments for the past year. 
Now, check that appointment list for lapses of time. Then check those dates against his personal checks and see what checks were made out during those periods of absences. This should tell us where Mr. Terrace was during those absences. Mr. Harding, we went over Mr. Terrace's office pad and found he was absent from his business during the past year on four different occasions, a week at each time. Good. Now, during those absences, did he make out any checks? His first absence corresponds with a check he made out at the Saratoga Hotel, Saratoga Springs. During Mr. Terrace's second absence, he made out a check at the clubhouse, Pine Hill, South Carolina. This third check was made out at a clubhouse, Atlanta, Georgia. Fine, thank you. Proceed. This is G6, calling from Saratoga Springs. Man in question spent week here in company of woman. Dark complexion, about 31, expensively dressed, unusually attractive. Full report follows. Fine. Proceed. G8, reporting from Pine Hill, South Carolina. Man in question stayed here accompanied by unknown woman in early 30s. Most attractive, expensively gowned, dark. Report follows. This is beginning to get very interesting, Mr. Hardy. Yet we may still be on a wild goose chase, Mark. We have no idea who that girl was. She may have been perfectly all right. But uh, how can we ever find her? She may be anywhere. Well, here's a little something I dug up. April 2nd, William Terrace made out a check to the Washington Jewelry Company for $8,000. Hmm... Say, that's a pretty sizable amount for a bachelor to be making out to send to a jewelry house. That's what I thought, Mark. I'm going to check that jewelry house. I wonder just what William Terrace bought with that $8,000. Mr. Terrace bought a solitaire diamond ring, ten and one-half carats, platinum setting, a woman's ring. We have no record that he said whom he was buying it for. That is all. Thank you. Well, Mark, now we know that Mr. Terrace bought a ring for some woman. But who is she? Where is she? Oh, that's a tough question, Mr. Harding. Well, let's put two and two together and try to make five. Check all insurance companies, Mark. Yes. And see if within a few days after April the 2nd, any woman insured a ring for approximately $8,000. Say, that's clever reasoning. <laughs> You win, Harding. We're getting hot. Here's the insurance report. April 5th, a solitaire diamond ring, platinum setting, was insured for $8,000 by a Miss Avery Rollins of 1370 Lincoln Boulevard, Northwest, Washington. Rollins. Avery Rollins. That name's very familiar. She's high society, Mr. Harding. Lives with her uncle and aunt. Uh -huh. Now, I got a report on her. Age 32, uh -huh. height 5 feet 5, light hair... Like complexion, very social, educated at the Sorbonne, Paris. Above reproach. Yeah, but the woman seen with William Terrace at the resorts was dark, dark hair. But the weights are approximately the same, both apparently wealthy, both smart dressers. Mark, there's something wrong, something very wrong. It's a problem that's got to be approached from some unusual angle. <laughs> You have a very luxurious apartment here, Colonel Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Harding. I'm pretty proud of it, especially this library den. I'm here to make a very unusual request, Colonel. As you may know, I'm a United States counter-spy. Yes, I do. Now, Colonel, you knew William Terrace personally, didn't you? Oh, yes. Was his suicide a bona fide suicide, Mr. Harding? Well, if you're perfectly frank, Colonel Reynolds, I don't know. That's why I've come to you. I need the aid of a citizen, Colonel, prominent, who has some government responsibility. Are you 48? That's correct. A bachelor? <laughs> a confirmed one. 
You're a very handsome man. Oh, come now. Come. Yes, and very fascinating to women. Now, wait a minute, Hardy. Oh, this is very serious business. Now, you're chairman on the board for the new airplane formations and armor. Yeah? That makes you a very interesting person to certain other persons. Colonel, do you happen to know a Miss Avery Rollins? A very gorgeous woman, but I've never happened to meet her. She's usually surrounded by any number of admirers. Well, I'm going to arrange for you to meet her, Colonel Reynolds. And I'm going to ask you to make yourself just as interesting to her as possible. In fact, I'm going to ask you to try and make it even a uh, constant attachment for a time. What? Oh, no, Harding, that's a little too much. I don't wish to get mixed up with women. Now, Colonel Reynolds... You could be the principal factor in possibly exposing one of the most cunning spy rings in this country today. You don't think Avery Rollins was in any way connected with Terrace's suicide? You don't think she's acting as a spy? That's what I want to find out, Colonel. Good Lord, Harding. I've arranged with Lady Keston to give a formal ball next Friday evening. I've given her a list of guests she's to include. Miss Rollins will be one. And I'd appreciate your being another and casually meeting her. Naturally, Rollins. Well, Mr. Harding, under these circumstances, no man could refuse. I thought you'd feel that way, sir. Now, after you meet her, please don't try to contact me in any way. Leave it up to me to find out what you're doing. Three weeks later, March 23rd. got the facts on that dark girl who's been meeting the colonel. Good. What did you find out? You were right, sir. After the girl got off the train with the colonel, I went to her compartment. There were unmistakable signs of dark-colored powder, blonde hair, and black hair which showed at the end of the hair, as if it had come out of a wig. Now, she must get on the train, get a compartment, and change her appearance before she comes out and meets the colonel. And it is Avery Rollins. Because she's been absent from Washington at the same time as the colonel has. She's probably explained to the colonel that because of their prominent standing in Washington, she must disguise herself. Then, the way I see it, this Avery Rollins must have been the mysterious dark woman with whom William Terrace went off on trips before he was murdered. Without a doubt. And she's connected with his murder in some manner. And I've got to make sure the colonel isn't killed the same way. She's off now down at Virginia Beach with him. What a sunset, Avery. Mm, beautiful. I love to lie on the beach after all the others have gone in. Look at those breakers on the sea. John, sometimes I see a look come over your face. A, a look of pain. Anything troubling you? No, dear. Nothing really. Perhaps you're worrying about your responsibilities. Those uh, new war plans or something. No, I don't think I am. Oh, I wish we didn't have to go back to Washington tomorrow. We must, though. I've got some important conferences. Here, uh, put these in your bag, will you, Avery? 
I'm afraid I'll lose them in the sand. Oh, but why bring keys down to the beach? I don't dare leave them in the hotel room. The flat one is the key to the secret cabinet in my library. It has the government plans we're drawing up. Oh, no, no, John. Don't give me the keys. It's too big a responsibility. Well, all right. I'll hide them next time under the rug at the hotel. Oh, silly. <laughs> Let's go in the water. Come on. Uh, all right. I'll beat you to it. Oh, you just try. <laughs> Oh, I was looking for you, Harding. Well, hello, Colonel Reynolds. Glad to see you. Sit down. Thank you. Hmm. Now, I thought it might be better for us to meet openly at the hotel here rather than for me to go again to your apartment. A good many things have happened since we last talked, Harding. Yes. And you've proved yourself a veteran. A professional counter-spy couldn't have done better. Anything the matter, Harding? Well, I think the big moment's here. It's now or never. What shall I do? Now, I'd like to have you invite Miss Rollins up to your apartment Tuesday night for a formal dinner. Just you two. I'll try. You don't think, do you, Harding, Miss Rollins really is a spy? Yes, Colonel. I do. But I kept the key to my secret file where she could get it. Called her attention to it. Harding, tell me the truth. You don't think Miss Rollins was the girl who was with Terrace on those trips before he committed suicide? Yes. His blood is on her hands, Colonel. And probably the blood of a dozen other men. Now, Tuesday night, after you've had dinner, I wish you'd go with her into your library den for coffee. But under no conditions, Colonel, drink the coffee. Now, I'll casually drop in a little later. Hmm. You intend to break her Tuesday night? If I can. And I hope I can. What's the matter, Colonel? You're white as a sheet. I... I'm all right. What? Can I get you something? No, I... What is it, Colonel? You can tell me. Harding, I love her. You don't mean that. Yes. Yes, I do mean it. I love her. But good heavens, man, you can't. But I do. I think she's innocent. She didn't try to copy the key. She, she's never tried to ask me questions about secret government affairs. But she's a murderess, Colonel. Take my word for it. The blood of Terrace is on her. She double-crossed you in a second. I didn't realize how lonely I'd been. She's so clever, smart, beautiful, everything about her. I can't stand it. You're not thinking of doing what William Terrace did? No. No, not that. I guess I can see it through. I'm sorry, Colonel. Terribly sorry. Mm. I guess there's no more to be said. You'll go through with it tomorrow night, as planned. Yes. Now remember, do not drink any coffee that's poured. I wish I could say something, Colonel Reynolds. I I feel for you from the bottom of my heart. But this is bigger than you, or me. I know. But still, I think she's innocent. Some more champagne, Avery? Please, John. That's a stunning evening gown. It blends right with your skin. Oh, <laughs> flattered. Some more champagne for you, sir. Yes. Uh, and Martin. Uh, yes, sir. Miss Avery and I will have our brandy and coffee in the library tonight. Yes, sir. And I'd like to have you remain this evening. Very good, sir. Oh, uh, by the way, Avery, did you ever know William R. Terrace? Terrace? Uh, wasn't he the man who committed suicide about four months ago? Yes. I've seen him, but um, I've never met him. Oh, awful thing, wasn't it? Mm. I've heard some people say it, uh, it wasn't suicide. Yes, but you can't tell from rumors. 
Like the silverware? Oh, <laughs> you caught me looking at it, John. Yes, okay. I do like it. Everything about this place, it's, uh, it's so tasteful. I had thought I was perfectly contented. But now it all seems so insignificant. To have something really worthwhile, you've got to have someone to share it with. I found the same thing true, John. Closeness and comradeship mean more than anything. Uh, shall I have Martin serve the coffee and brandy in the library? Yes, do I finish? Yeah, let me help you. But I'd rather sit on the divan with you. Avery, you look like the most sophisticated woman in the world. Like one of those gorgeous paintings. And then you say something so tender. Oh, but a woman should be a mystery to a man. Oh, there. Avery. I know. But you don't know how much. Yes, I do, John. My heart's pitter-pattering the same way. It has been... Ever since that last trip. Do you love me, Avery? Yes, John. Very deeply. Avery. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, pardon me, sir, but uh, Mr. Harding and his friend have called. Oh, uh, yes. Yes, Martin, show them in. Oh. Why did they have to come at just this moment? Well, Harding's a very good friend, I guess. He's just dropping in. Oh, we were just on our way to the club. We thought we'd stop in, Colonel. Hello, Harding. Glad to see you. Have you met Miss Rollins? I don't believe I've had that privilege. Good evening, Miss Rollins. Good evening, Mr. Harding. Well, Miss Rollins is a friend of mine, Mr. Mark. Good evening, Mr. Mark. It's a pleasure. And Colonel Reynolds, Mark. Good evening, Mr. Mark. Won't you join us in the brand and coffee? No, thank you. We've just finished dinner. Well, sit down, gentlemen, and make yourselves comfortable. Thank you. Well, while you men chat, I think I'll go and freshen up a bit. We just finished dinner. A delicious dinner, Mr. Harding, but fried chicken, and you know what that does to the hand. <laughs> well, I've always maintained the only real place to really enjoy fried chicken was in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> well, you men chat, and I'll be back in just a few moments, if you'll excuse me. Harding, it's all right to talk in front of Mr. Mark? Yes, Colonel. He's a counter-spy in active service. Harding, it can't be true. She's too decent. I'm going crazy. Now, Colonel Reynolds, I'm going to have to be brutal tonight. Ordinarily, I wouldn't operate this way. But I'm going to do everything I can to expose this right here in front of you. But I believe I owe it to you. Tell me, Harding, she's really one of your agents working with you. Tell me that you suspected me and really did this so she could check on me. Tell me that. He's my mind. The only way, Colonel, is to let this unfold. Now, would you ring for your butler, please? Why, yes. Yes. Harding, is it the butler you're really after? Tell me it's he and not Avery, isn't it? Colonel, I know how upset you are. I sympathize. But I can't change the facts. Now, don't say anything for a minute. Did you ring for me, sir? I believe the colonel wanted you to pour some brandy for me. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> this is a gun in your stomach. Don't move. Harding! Quiet, please, colonel. Cuff his hands behind him, Mark. Tight. Yes. I've, I've got him. Then he's yes. the man you're after, not Avery. I believe he... Are you smart? There. Without his wig, he looks more natural, like his pictures. Your butler, Colonel Reynolds, is Herr Franz Bergmann, one of the cleverest Austrian spies. I am not him. I do not know whom you are talking about. Colonel, when your butler was hurt by a car six weeks ago, you might be interested to know it was a plot. The man at the wheel of the car which ran down your butler was this man standing here. He wanted to pose as a butler so he could get in your house here. We've been checking on him for weeks. Here. Drink the coffee you served the colonel. Drink it. Now, oh. you don't like doped coffee, eh, huh, Bergman? Please, Harding Avery is coming back. I'll watch her when she comes in. I think she'll be pretty surprised. Is something the matter in here? Well, is that your butler? His hair is... Yes, Miss Rollins. We removed his wig. Why? Well, for the reason that he happens not to be a butler. But Herr Franz Berkman, a very noted Austrian spy. A spy? He's a spy? Yes. Quite a catch. Oh, I'm so glad you caught him. Mark, take Berkman over to the other side of the room. Come on, Hitler. Or I'll lead you by the nose. Oh, John, you must feel terribly about this taking place in your apartment. Here, take this brandy. You look like a ghost. Thank you. Thank you, Avery. Thanks. Now, Colonel Reynolds, I have a record I'd like to play for you. Would you mind my using your machine? Why, no. No, the switch is right on the side of the radio. It's just a short recording. I, uh... 
I feel a little dizzy. I guess I'll sit here by you, Avery. Good. What kind of a record is it, Mr. Harding? What's the purpose of it? Oh, I believe that it'll be self-explanatory. It was made last night. There. The lines were spoken rather softly at the time, but I'll turn on the full volume so we won't miss anything. Yeah. Quick, get the camera ready. Oh, I can't find anything but personal paper. Oh, they must be there. The colonel told me himself. He kept them in the wall safe in his library. Yes, yeah, all right, but if we don't find them... You just have to keep on playing him. Oh, that old fool. I want to spit in his face every time I get near him. I can't stand to touch him. Oh, the plans are not here. Yeah, he has tricked you. But they must be there. Oh, uh, we have failed tonight. <laughs> but he'll probably put them in here tomorrow night. I hope tonight would be the last. Then I could break him and force him to commit suicide like terrorists. If he won't, we'll poison his coffee. Oh, not so oh, quick. Little dog, it's vermin. I'll spit at you. I'll kill you. Avery, do you know what you're saying? You pig, you swine. Let go of me. Fortunately, Colonel Reynolds, the plans weren't there. But if they had been, you wouldn't be alive tonight. She'd have worked on you till she'd gotten you to commit suicide. No, and I would have made him kill himself, just like I made Terrence kill himself. Shut up, you fool. Don't talk. Yeah, she'd have told you she'd gotten the plans, that you'd be disgraced. She'd have broken your heart. You'd have done what all the other men have done she's worked on. And I would have laughed at the stupid dog. Colonel, her real name is Marie Schmitz of Hungary, a paid spy. She goes to the biggest bidder. This woman is one of the cleverest, if not the cleverest, paid woman spy in this country. And that butler of yours, Franz Berkman, is her husband. Take them away, Mark. The other agents are out in the front hall. Yes, sir. Oh, keep your hands off. Come on now. Come on. Come on. I'm sorry, Colonel, but I had to strip it all down before you, so you'd never have any doubt. I didn't know. A person could be hurt quite this much. You may have saved the lives, Colonel, of thousands of our boys. I hope so. Come over here by the window for a minute, would you, Colonel? Why couldn't she have been what I hoped she was? Look at those Marines swing along. You've done them and the boys like them a great service, Colonel Reynolds. No one will probably ever know about it. But you will. And I will. Let's open the window. Doesn't that send a thrill through you? It does. Yes. I'm glad I was able to help Harding. Every one of us has got to sacrifice some one way, some another. I guess this way is mine. <laughs> Over this country tonight is spread a great army of counter spies, men working to protect you and our boys at the front. Special agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, of the Secret Service, of the Treasury and State Departments, of the Intelligence Bureaus of the Army and the Navy. Men who are constantly on the alert, diligently protecting our home front. These men beg of you not to talk concerning troop movements, armaments, defense plants, and wartime plans. There are many leeches, enemy agents, just waiting to pounce on every little scrap of information so their experts can piece it together into a big, compact picture of our war efforts. Next Monday evening, counter-spy David Harding will be on the air. Tell your friends, invite them to listen in to these exciting, dramatized cases portrayed weekly at this time. Counterspy is a Phillips H. Lord production which has originated from New York. This is the Blue Network.